say a few words um, before I start. Um, this is based on my PhD. So uh, I did spend a number of years thinking about this. Um, and then I did convert it into a book and um, got it published by Springer. So you could say that I've been in, immersed in this topic of inner peace for, I would say, about eight years now. Um, whether writing a PhD on inner peace is a means to inner peace, I'm not sure. Uh, maybe yeah. I could have... Maybe I could have attained inner peace uh, in other yeah. ways, more relaxing ways, but it's been a fascinating journey. And it's one that I would say that I'm continuing to understand and try to grasp, especially as Hakan mentioned with the mental health issues that we see. Um, I, I'm seeing where the, this, the, the, the work that's been, I guess, um, in our Islamic tradition can comfortably help us in this space. So I, I will... Um, be looking at this uh, inner peace in Islam from Said Nursi's perspective. Now, another point I want to make is Said Nursi did not actually talk about, um, you know, he did not say this is how you get inner peace in Islam. Like it wasn't directly like that. So a lot of the research I did was looking at what he was saying. Um, and I think the key thing is my starting point when I was reading his work was that, um, you know, he's providing a worldview that actually makes us feel more at peace. Um, so that's when I read his work, that's how I felt. And then I felt, I guess, I could look at his work and try to formulate what he was saying in a language that was most, um, you know, I guess, understandable for us, but also identifying the areas where he speaks about uh, where I thought they were related to inner peace and then to draw on those. So that, that's kind of the approach that I took. Now, what's important is when, when you're talking about a big topic like inner peace, which has got so many elements to it, we have to know what the starting point is and what Nursi's starting point was. Um, and this will become more ap apparent as we're talking through the topic. Um, but this is really the, I guess, the premises of every, this is the premises that everything builds on. Or the inner peace that we're talking about is built on this, I guess, starting point, and it's in the Quran where it says, I have not created the jinn and humankind, but to know and to worship me. So this, I guess, if we're going to understand in peace from Nursi's perspective, we need to understand that this is the purpose of life of human beings. It's to worship Allah, to worship God, um, and to do that, we need to have knowledge of God, but also love of God, as Nursi highlights. So I'm giving you the, I guess, the, uh, the conclusion in a way to, you know, what I'm going to say, and then I'm going to break it down. But I would say that um, according to Nursi, one attains inner peace by giving meaning to life and events through a Tawhid-centric worldview. So Tawhid means oneness of God. Um, so your, where your worldview, um, I guess at the center of your worldview is that belief in the oneness of God. It comes across in his writings extensively. And I will break this down further to, to explain what this might be. Um, and it might seem like it's so, I guess, you know, obvious for Muslims to have a Tawhid centric worldview. But I want to highlight at this point that we are so much distracted or influenced by our surrounding environment um, with countering worldviews that although this may be in theory or at, at some point um, it's within us at some level it's not always strongly embedded um, and it doesn't always influence the decisions we make or the meaning we give to things so i hope that makes it uh, that um, makes sense you know muslims believe in one god but how much that one god belief in that one god directs and influences our decision making our perceptions uh, is another thing basically now uh, tawhid is a big concept in the quran the oneness of god it could be argued that at least um, a quarter of the quran talks about tawhid in one way or another this is just one example of such a, of such a point uh, say we believe in the revelation which has come down to us and in that which came down to you. Our God and your God is one and it is to him we bow in submission. So many verses such as this which uh, highlight um, the oneness of God uh, and the importance of believing in one God. 
Now, Nursi, you could say, takes this point and um, uh, and really takes takes off with it. Let's put it that way in today's language. So, one example of what he says: the true affirmation of divine unity is to attain a perpetual awareness of the divine presence and to confirm and believe almost with the certainty of seeing that everything emerges from the hand of God's power and that in no way does he have any partner or assistant in his divinity, ownership and governance of the universe. So you can see here where what I was talking about before, like whether it's the level of conviction or level of certainty that you know there is a one and there is the one god and everything everything emerges from his um from his hand of power now how does um, one do this and what are its implications could be the question like why is such a strong conviction so important and i guess in the case of my presentation why is it so important for inner peace uh, and this is what i'll be focusing on now i i would say that there are three things that help to contribute to a tohid centric worldview and this helps to build in a way, or each one then helps to um, develop that Tohid centric worldview and therefore the inner peace that comes forward. And, um, and each one does do that as in help to attain inner peace in its own way. But yet they do build on each other as well, because everything is interconnected, as Norsi explains. So witnessing God in everything, this is such an important part of his writing. <clears throat> uh, and he gives many examples in it. Uh, and I've spent many hours trying to grasp some of the things he said. But one thing that he particularly focuses on is the, um, what we call the manaisim and manayahav, meaning by the um, word self-referential, I'll explain what this is, and meaning by the letter other indicative. So he basically says when you look at something, um, you look at it as its own entity, or you look at it because it, um, ref or you know, it's indicating something else. That's why the word other indicative. Uh, and he says, point in this when it's indicating something else, it's pointing to its creator where God's names are manifested on it. So, this is a very important part of his, uh, uh you know, in of what he says. Everything in a way is indicating God. Um, and I didn't put it in this slide, but I but, um, the names of God are very important as well. So in a way, um, Nursi is asking us to decode the universe through the names of God. So basically, the, the, the oneness of God, the Tawhid uh, aspect of God is in a way broken down or better understood by decoding the universe through the names of God. I, I really like that word decoding because it's you need to be able to break it down. And he gives you the tools to do that. So when everything is viewed from the perspective of meaning by the letter, they are seen as signs of God. So they're indicating or other, in, other indicative of, of, of God. In this state, a person can read and witness the signs of his Lord everywhere, making him constantly aware of God's presence. So with this perspective of other indicative, everything is like a mirror to God. So when you see something like a tree or the ocean or the sky or a human being, um, you, they're reminding you or they're reflecting of names gods and therefore they are a reminder of God to you. And, and we'll look at some examples of names. So I've, visualized, I've given you an example here of one way to break down what I'm saying. So with a book, the, the letters so you can either see a letter a book as just letters so there's a k there's an n there's an l m so you've got a tree you've got grass you've got rocks you've got trees uh, uh you've got soil and so forth you can break it down like that um and in their own entity that they, they mean something but really when you bring them all together when you put bring all the letters together um the true meaning of things have really come to fruition then. On their own right, they've got some, some meaning or the, uh, yeah, some meaning, but their true meaning in a way is when all those entities come together. And this other indicative is where through the writing, it's indicating the author. In this case, because I've got a book, I've put, put this, an author. So when you read a book, it tells you about the author. Um, when you 
seeing a piece of artwork, it tells you about the artist. Um, when you see any, any object that's been designed, it tells you about the designer. So the other indicative is where you're looking at an object, but it's really telling you about something, um, its origin in a way, or the source of it. Another way when, when he talks about the other indicative um, is where he gives the analogy of the mirror. And this is also quite powerful. Um, so he says there's two ways, uh, and this continues with that meaning by the letter, meaning by the word, whether you see it as it's indicating itself or something else. He says with the mirror, there's two ways of looking at it. You could look at it as, you know, the actual mirror or the glass. That's what I mean, like the glass that makes the mirror. And you focus on that or you focus on the image reflected in the mirror. And he says that the mirror needs to be looked at for a meaning other than itself, which is the reflection. So, because if you just look at the mirror, I mean, the mirror is there for, has a purpose and that's something he's trying to highlight. The mirror has a purpose of reflecting. Its purpose is purely to reflect what is looking at it. So, um, but if you don't, you know, look at the, but if you just look at the glass of it, you're, you're not uh, fulfilling the purpose of the mirror or you're using the mirror for its wrong purpose. Uh, whereas if you look at the mirror and uh, with the purpose of seeing the reflection, say if you're looking at your, your, yourself at the, and you're looking at the reflection of yourself, then the mirror is fulfilling its purpose. So in other words, when you look at the creation, um, if you're looking at it because it's mirroring the names of God to you, then your, that entity is being looked at the way it's meant to be looked at. So this is an important part of uh, Nursi's I guess, explanation of the worldview and how the world should be viewed. And this will, I will develop this further, but this makes a huge difference because I do, in today's day and age, we very much focus on entities, including ourselves, without thinking, what does this mean for a greater meaning? It's very much like, what does this mean to me? Um, you know, why, what does this, um, what is this telling me? Whereas when you look at, it, at, from the bigger picture, it has a lot more meaning than what it means to you. Okay, so getting to know God. And as I mentioned right at the beginning, knowledge of God is a key part of worshipping God. Uh, and Nursi focuses on this a lot. And, the, and um, everything becomes a mirror to the names of God. Um, so we get to know God through the reflection of his names on the universe we see glimpses of God's names. So, um, and he gives many examples, but there's also hadith that give example and the example of a, um, you know, a mother showing mercy towards a child uh, in, in one particular hadith without going into detail and saying that God's mercy is greater than a mother's mercy towards her child. So even in that hadith, we see uh, God is, or the prophet is giving an analogy of how mercy is embedded in us in a finite uh, amount but we are basically uh, mirroring the, the mercy and the compassion of God. Um, so the universe therefore becomes a, a source of knowledge of God, uh, whether it's, you know, and okay, I've got another, I think I've got an example with details. Yeah, this one. So this is just one example that Nurse talks about, say with a flower, just by looking at a flower, these are the names that come out and can be drawn out um, and in a way, so these are the names of God that can be decoded from a flower. So when you look at a flower, you can just think, oh, this is so pretty. It looks lovely. Or you can look at it and think, wow, all these names of God are, are being manifest through this flower. Determiner, orderer, giver of form, artistic maker, uh, benevolent, bountiful, uh, gentle, compassionate, merciful. So you could see that um, there's one way of looking at a flower and thinking that's so pretty, which is, it is pretty, uh, but you can also look at it as a creation. So you're connecting um, the creation then to the creator, which is what Norsi emphasizes. And what's important, um, I guess this is where life events come into play in a way and how they connect to the names of God. So we do understand the names of God through, God through opposites, but also through our experiences. Um, for example, he, he gives this example. 
You need to experience illness to, imp- uh, to appreciate the name of God as Shafi, the healer. So if you've never been ill or if you don't know anyone that's been ill in your life, in, your, in this universe, then you could never really fully grasp the name healer. You need illness for, heal- for healing to take place. So this is an example where you need those kind of, let's call it um, frictions or dualities um, or opposites so that you can appreciate the names of God. You need to experience injustice to appreciate Allah, the just. If you've never had injustice in your life, you can never really appreciate justice. And black and white. So anything that's contrasting, unless you have darkness, you can't appreciate white. Unless you've seen um, evil, you cannot appreciate goodness. You need that contrast in life um, uh, for us to truly grasp these names of God uh, uh, in our everyday life. Like if you thought, think about it, and we see this sometimes when we're, when we're flying, there's, there's clouds. If you've never seen black in your life and all you see is white clouds, whiteness, and someone says to you, you know what, there's something called, um, this is all white. You'll be like, what do you mean it's white? It's just what it is kind of thing. Unless you have a contrast, you can't really appreciate that entity that you're seeing. You need to compare it. That's how our brains work. We need to compare it to something that exists as well that we've seen and we have comprehended. So I've got an example here. So this is, you know, darkness. If I said for, for you to really understand what darkness is, um, you, you, uh, without a dark background, you cannot see white, basically. So again, this is just to highlight that you need that contrast. So um, if there's darkness, then you see the goodness and vice versa. If this was, um, if you've got all white, you can't really see darkness on here. Um, you know, un, or you can't see white or goodness unless there's darkness. That again, we, our brain is wired so that we are comparing it to something. Uh, and and so it could be a spectrum or it could be the complete opposite. So contrast or duality is important. And this is important because in the context of what I'm saying, because um, like I mentioned, for healing, you need illness. And a lot of the time we see illness as a calamity. But if we don't have illness, we can't truly appreciate healing or good health. So it, it really enriches our lives um, to a large scale. So the other one, a point that Nursi makes is essential and relative beauty. So he, he says that in his, uh, and it, I would say it's based on this Quranic verse, who has created everything in the best way. So Nursi, in his own words, says everything in the universe, every event is either in itself beautiful, which is called essential beauty, or it is beautiful in regard to its outcomes, which is called relative beauty. So everything is beautiful or everything is good, either outright or through its outcomes or through the results. And this could be hard to grasp and I, uh, in, in, you know, in our everyday life. And I, and I truly believe the reason why it's hard for us to grasp is because we evaluate this world without truly putting the afterlife into consideration. You see, the minute you bring the afterlife into the, uh, you know, into the formula, that's when this truly makes sense. Um, there are some events that can be str- a struggle in this life and you see the, wes- uh, the wisdom in it in this life, like we call them blessings in disguise, um, you know, but there are some things where the, you, you, can't, you can't attribute goodness to it in this life from the lens that we're looking at it and it has to be because we need to take the afterlife into consideration. That's why I always, always say that um, not considering life or our lives without the afterlife is like a incomplete story. It's like a incomplete drawing or painting. It would not make sense. Um, And afterlife becomes a very important part of understanding what happens in this life. And, um, and that's something Norsi emphasizes. I'm just conscious of the time. Oh, dear. I did start late, Harkin, so I've got time. Um, and, and that's one angle, but he also breaks it down into other things like removing the minor evil cause would be a major evil. So again, if we look at something from my angle, say I live in a house and it's been flooded, 
Um, and I could say, well, I wish rain didn't exist because my there's an evil that happened. My house flooded. Basically, if I said then I wish rain didn't exist at all because it caused me this minor evil, it's going to be a bigger evil because if you don't have rain on this earth, then there's going to be extinction of all living things on earth. So he tries to show that sometimes an incident um, can have, uh, you know, it could be discomfort or a struggle for us at one level, but it doesn't mean you want its elimination because it's for serving a greater purpose. And so the wisdom aspect of it's so important. There could be um, thousands of wisdoms behind an act. And as he says, like there are multiple angles, thousands of angles that could look to a particular incident. And the, in the way you're looking, uh, I'm looking at it, is just one angle of it. Um, and therefore, it's a very limited perspective of, this, of the scenario. Um, so, you know, some possible scenarios, just to explain what I mean, justice prevails without directly to what we see. Um, you know, I'll, the others are probably easy to explain. An act may prevent a greater calamity. So, for example, my car might break down on my way to... Um, on my way to uh, to work, and I might think, "Oh, this is this is not good." But my car breaking down may have been a prevention of me having a fatal car accident, for example. So that could be one one way. Or I might lose, um, you know, my house in a fire, but um, that might prevent me from in the future using that money to gamble. So you, in a way, it's thinking of what this could be a protection of something greater. And also there is a number of hadith that talk about how calamity is, um, uh, you know, it can, um, there's great reward for it. Um, and so, you know, there's a spiritual gain as well. And that's the other important thing when we're looking at something, we, do we looking at it purely from a physical perspective or are we considering the metaphysical, the spiritual element of things as well? Uh, an act may disadvantage us, but may serve a greater purpose, um, you know, you know, wearing the the mask, I may have thought, oh, this is such a, um, I don't want to wear the mask. It's it's very uncomfortable. But if it's serving a greater purpose of, you know, protecting um, the spread of a contagious virus, you know, you think it's, you would fulfill that, um, dis, you know, discomfort or you would go, go ahead with it. Um, but as much as we can explain these things and many things in life uh, can be explained when we look at it from various perspectives, when we look at it in hindsight, when we say in hindsight, that was not so bad. Um, as much as we can do that, the reality is, and as Nursi highlights, true justice will prevail in the afterlife. So everything can't be explained away, basically on, from this earth's perspective, some things need to be, um, you know, will be explained or will be rewarded basically in the afterlife. So the third one is giving meaning to major calamities. This is a sticking point for a lot of people um, and probably because it causes a lot of pain, causes us a lot of pain and something um, that he focuses on as well, Nursi focuses on. Um, and this crony verse comes to mind, perhaps you hate a thing and it is good for you and perhaps you love a thing and it is bad for you and Allah knows while well, you know not. So again, this is a, uh, goes back to what we've been talking about, the perspective you know, what perspective are we looking at it? It could be that the perspective that we're seeing it from is problematic and that there are um, other benefits to it that, that we may not be aware of there and then. Um, and Nursi also highlights that this world, and based on this chronic verse, that this world is a, a world of tests, a world of ser service and a world of worship. So the, the whole thing about this world, the way he sees it, going back to that Quranic verse I mentioned initially is about knowing God and worshiping God. And the tests are there as a means to achieve that. Um, and our experiences and interactions are there for us to achieve that. Um, so he reminds us, says, just remember why you're on this earth, basically. You're not here to have fun and, you know, and, you know, have a jolly good time. It doesn't mean you need to be miserable, but it means that, your ultimate purpose is to know God and to worship God. So it always comes back to that. Uh, and you hear in these hadiths really change the way um, 
you know, I guess hardships or calamities are viewed. If God wants to do good to somebody, he afflicts him with trials. Hardships continue to befall a believing man and woman in their body, family and property until they meet God burdened with no sins. So again, trying to dissociate hardships and challenges with God must hate me if he's putting me through this. So here, through these, we're getting the message that hardships and challenges are not there because God hates you. They're there because God wants to purify you um, and he wants you to spiritually elevate. Um, and Nusi takes it to another level. And, you know, when he says about calamity, he, he really challenges our understanding of what a calamity is. Um, so ba like, for example, he gives the example of someone who's, and he gives a scenario, he's got a friend who's very sick um, and he's unwell and they want him to make dua for him, pray for him to get better. Then he thinks, you know what, this person, because they're sick, it protects them from doing committing sins. It humbles them. It does this. So maybe this sickness is good for this person. Obviously, it doesn't mean we should ask for sickness in our life, but seeing how um, you know sicknesses can be a blessing in disguise. So the way he, he describes it is one afflicted with misfortune or sickness perceives his own weakness and helplessness. That's not a bad thing because um, you know it helps us to better. I guess, calibrate our relationship with God. We are the weak and the helpless. God is the powerful, the helper, the provider, turns to his compassionate sustainer. When we're sick and, you know, we're desperate for healing, so we turn to our compassionate sustainer. That's not a bad thing. Seeks refuge in him, in Allah. Um, so that's not a bad thing. Medi meditates upon him, petitions him, and thus offers a pure form of worship that no hypocrisy can penetrate. Some of our most sincere supplications, prayers, are when we're in desperate need. And so when you think about what that does to your spiritual heart, about the type of connection you have with God at those moments of misfortune, um, he basically is saying, is that really misfortune then? If that hardship, that challenge, that calamity is bringing you closer to God, is that truly a calamity? And he, he basically says that uh, something is a calamity if it disconnects you from God. That is a calamity. So that could, if your health disconnects you from God, that's a calamity. If your money disconnects you from God, that's a calamity. Uh, having said that, again, these not, are not necessarily bad things. Someone could um, have good health and that can facilitate their connection with God because with their good health, they might do more worship and you know, do all the things that you know, God wants from them. But it just depends on what that means for a particular individual, and that can vary. Um, I just want to, yeah, so God's mercy are of two types, Nursi mentions, which emanates directly from the treasure of God's mercy and beauty. So this is very clearly seen, it's open. You see God's mercy and beauty, you know, uh, through the way he nurtures us, sustains us, and so forth. The second time type, which results occasionally from his universal laws, he mentions. Such universal laws need to take place according to Nursi to keep the earth and life on earth functioning. So the equilibrium, like an earthquake. He gives the example of an earthquake. If you don't have an earthquake, then it's going to cause imbalance in the core of the earth. And that's actually worse for the earth and the life that lives on earth. So through one earthquake where the tectonic plates might be moving, it calms things down and therefore allows life on earth to continue. Um, but obviously that, you know, that one earthquake can cause local heartache and suffering, but for the overall uh, functioning of the earth, it's needed, basically. Um, so Nursi states, there are greater benefits, beauties in natural disasters as they are a demonstration of God's universal and specific compassion and love. Um, so the universal is, it helps life on earth to continue. It maintains the order. But the, the local, again, it's very circumstantial. Um, and if we go with the example of earthquake, and he talks about this as an example, because uh, you know, during his lifetime, there was an earthquake that took place. Uh, and, and so it was very prevalent. Uh, and people wanted to know, what do, we, what, what do we make out of this earthquake? How do we understand it? It's caused so much death and suffering. Um, and he, he explains it. 
he says, firstly, I mean, firstly, it could be that we're causing some of the problems. You know, if we know somewhere is a, uh, a, a um, it's dangerous to build in a particular area, if we're building houses, then we're causing, uh, we're adding to the problem. But having said that, if you've got innocent people that are, say, uh, suffering from that earthquake, it's a means of spiritual progress, he explains, because any kind of suffering where you're, you're hurting, it's a means of spiritual progress. The innocent will be recompensed. And he gives the example, if someone loses their house, it's like they've given charity. That, that uh, wealth becomes like um, they've given charity. If the innocent die, um, you know, they, they die as a, uh, that means that they will have a permanent good life in the hereafter. So again, you see how important the hereafter is with this. Someone innocently living in their house, they die in an earthquake, but it means eternal bliss for them. So that has to be taken into consideration when we look at incidents happening in this world. Um, and interestingly, when he talks about this um, example of earthquake, he focuses on the names of God, all wise and compassionate. So knowing the wisdom that Allah, God is the all wise, he does things in wisdom. And sometimes that wisdom we may not fully be able to grasp. So what we see is that there is justice, the way Nursi explains it, on the individual, because he will, uh, God will um, reward the person, um, elevate them spiritually, what have you, at an individual level based on their life circumstances, and there is justice collectively. I guess the biggest sticking point is when we look at something like an incident, like a calamity like this, a natural disaster, we're looking at individuals and we're seeing the suffering without really understanding what this means possibly for their afterlife, how they're going to benefit from it in their, uh, for eternity. So in conclusion, inner peace is a product of one's worldview and that Tawhid-centric worldview is important. It requires a perspective that focused on God's science in the universe. Everything is beautiful outright or in regards to its outcomes, as Nursi says, and major calamities need to be addressed for the heart to be fully content. So we need to understand how these major calamities give meanings to them, um, you know, the way that, um, based on what Nursi was explaining. This worldview becomes the source of inner peace in Nursi's thought because you're able to, I guess, give meaning to things that make you content that don't leave you feeling uh, anguished and distressed as much. Um, there is correlation between one's in a peaceful state and how they function in society as well. So that brings me to the end of my presentation. Uh, all right, Zuleha, thank you so much. I think a uh, very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, it looks at perspectives. You know, our perspectives are very crucial here in order to have uh, inner peace and connecting with God and giving purpose to our life uh, actually, uh, yeah, I I see that many people actually are seeking uh, to give any meaning or purpose to their life. I remember one of the effective quality, one of the, one of the qualities of effective leadership. I think seven. One of them is giving a purpose or a meaning to a life, and uh, spirituality uh, and inner peace, serenity. People, many people are looking mm -hmm. for. I remember. Sorry, sorry, just uh, cut you, but even with that, the seven, I think you're talking about Steve Covey's seven, highly, uh, seven habits of highly effective people. Yes, and yes. one of his principles is also beginning with the end in mind. Yes, so this, again, yes. the Akira, the afterlife is so critical. Like we need to live our life with the end in mind. Yeah, sorry, yeah, you were yeah. saying. Yeah. yeah, definitely. And people, many, many people are, for example, some people are very rich. They have everything, but they're looking for mm -hmm. spirituality serenity, peace, you know, they are traveling around. I remember during my PhD, uh, I attended a one week workshop uh, in, uh, in Princeton you know, in the United States. I remember one photographer from India, he traveled to the USA. Uh, he's, he, he said that yeah, I'm looking for a path, a spiritual path. Uh, yeah, he has everything, he has job, he has everything, but. Uh, this is something I think many people uh, are seeking in, in this life, peace, uh, serenity, or uh, maybe spirituality, spiritual uh, satisfaction. You know, Absolutely. Talking Definitely. about India, sorry, just I, I read a book, The Resilience Project. Uh, I was just looking at the, it's written by Hugh Van Kuylenberg. He's a teacher. Very, 
it talks about how he's a teacher and he sees how the um, kids in his Australian actually in Melbourne and he compares to these children in India he goes if the children in India have hardly anything they're playing with like broken chains as toys their uh, their shoes have holes in them but he says that they're much more happier uh, more content than the children say in in Australia and again it's um, you know you wouldn't ex the way we understand happiness that doesn't make sense in the, in the I guess the western way let's call it but um, he's really highlighting that it's about perspective and also seeing blessings as well yeah yes thank you uh, do you have any questions any comments to Zuleha and her presentation please feel free to join and feel free to provide your comments or questions or any reflections please please raise your hand or you can write on chat box as well you can type on chat box as well Any questions, any reflections on the topic? Uh, all right, Zulia, may I ask you something? Uh, of course, you focused on this inner peace and perspectives look very important. And uh, also you connected this topic with names of Allah. Uh, it looks that Ustaz Nursi, uh, actually his project is very connected with uh, Tasawuf area, names of Allah, their manifestations on human being, on nature. Uh, yeah, which, particularly which religious, which traditions in Islamic history do you think that uh, he is bringing to to today's world, what do you think? He's been influenced by many, um, you know, many historic scholars um, like the Naqshbandi order to some degree. Imam Ghazali, some of the things he talks about are very linked to what Imam Ghazali writes, talks about as well. But So there are many, but what, what's interesting is he tries to, um, I guess Tasawwuf, um, it, it, it's really in the 20th or 21st century, uh, or Sufism hasn't been uh, so, I guess, easy to apply because we're living in such, um, I guess, uh, a world where, you know, the physical is so prominent. So it's really fascinating how, therefore, he approaches the names of God because it, in a way he's saying, you know, you don't have to isolate yourself, seclude yourself, not that he's against that, but you can basically through your everyday life, through your everyday busy schedule, you can witness God in everything that you look around. So I really like that. He's, it's almost like I feel he's trying to implant this program in our brains where you, you can look at something, even a laptop, and think about God uh, or reflect on God because you think just as this has, um, you know, got potential, I always, uh, you know, the laptop's got potential. I can do this, this, this. Humans have great potential as well. Or just as someone's uh, designed and created this laptop, then a lot, th this universe must have a creator or a designer. And he mentions that he says, just as, as an author has a book, a, a book has an author, the, cre um, the universe has a creator. So it's very powerful how he, um, I guess, um, makes it relevant to our everyday life and, and, and brings in all those a very, very historical scholars in his writing in a way that the 20th, 21st century, um, you know, Muslim can understand. But despite that, having said that, like I mentioned at the beginning, um, the premises that we start our journey on is so important. Uh, and that is that believing in one God and worshiping God and belief in afterlife. And like you would know, he, he goes to... Uh, he goes to... That's all right. He goes to extensive efforts to try to prove that belief in the afterlife will exist. Resurrection will exist. Um, and he does this for a Muslim audience because he knows that this is something that Muslims are challenged with. But without that belief in the afterlife, this world would not make sense. So I just like how he's so um, relevant and uh, takes into note the challenges with faith that Muslims have today. 
All right, Julia, great, great points. Thank you so much. Uh, any other comments or reflections or, or, or any questions? All right, uh, all right. I think everything is very clear. Thank you, Zuleha. Uh, yeah, if there is no any further questions or comments or reflections. No Wishing you all inner peace, inshallah. <laughs> inshallah, thank you so much. Uh, just keep in mind that this session is recorded and after the recording, we will upload this session as we did uh, for the previous ones. It will be available on SizeX uh, research website and for, uh, for for the public. Thank you so much. Now, uh, after Zuleha's great presentation, our second presenter uh, is Professor Associate, Associate Professor is uh, Suleyh Salih Yücel. Let me give it uh, to you some information about Professor Salih Yücel. Uh, he received his Bachelor of Islamic Theology at the University of Ankara and his Master of Theology at the University of Sydney. He worked as a Muslim chaplain in Australia and then at uh, Brigham and Women Hospital, which is an affiliated health institution of Harvard Medical School. He completed his doctorate at Boston University in 2007. His doctoral research was the effect of prayer on Muslim patients' well-being. Salih worked as a lecturer and senior lecturer at Center for Religious Studies at Monash University between 2008 and 14. Currently, he teaches at the Center for Islamic Studies and Civilization at Charles Sturt University. He is also a part-time lecturer at the Australian Catholic University. He is the author of four books, co-author of one book, and the author of several books and book chapters. Uh, it is a pleasure and uh, honor to host you, Professor Yuja. Please, uh, you can uh, start your presentation. We can follow. Well, thank you, Hakan. Uh, well, after that uh, wonderful presentation, probably mine will not be in the same level. So just so I want to <laughs> say in, in the beginning, uh, my topic uh, is uh, about is online clinical pastoral education effective? I will focus on an Australian uh, case study. So as it's known, uh, COVID-19 travel restrictions gave negatively impact face-to-face clinical pastoral education, supervision, teaching, and training. The pandemic forced many clinical pastoral education programs to cancel in person and move online in Australia, as well as in the world. Due to lock lockdown and COVID-19 travel restrictions, the Islamic Science and Research Academy of Australia, which is pioneering in the clinical pastoral education, with the cooperation of New South Wales, College of Clinical Pastoral Education uh, have had to run a CP course in Sydney. So you're on mute, Dr. Sali. You may have accidentally been put on mute. Sorry, not me. Okay. Thank you. So the online CP program uh, opened new horizon, but also some challenges. So uh, this presentation first examines the result of a data that I collected in six months from, from online group and individual teaching and supervision in CP or clinical pastoral education. And secondly, it uh, analyzes the findings of a survey conducted to determine the degree of satisfaction with the online teaching and supervision. And thirdly, it analyzes the challenges and advantages or disadvantages of online teaching and supervision. Uh, the result of online CP and individual supervision data shows that there are some uh, blind spots. Finally, uh, this presentation argues that online supervision does not give a real sense compared to face-to-face -face interactions. So this study finds that various types of distractions that uh, lack of nonverbal messages and building intimacy negatively impact online CP compared in person. So as I mentioned earlier, the Islamic Science and Research Academy of Australia with the cooperation of New South Wales College of Clinical Pastoral Education uh, run at this course. Although it was a prerequisite to complete uh, 150 hours of supervised placement, 
over 22 weeks, including 80 hours in the hospital uh, and uh, 70 hours in part, part, part fixations at workplace, it was not possible due to lockdown and travel restrictions in Sydney uh, during this course. So this uh, research has limitation. Uh, one limitation is that uh, the survey uh, conducted only 40 people participated. Uh, and the second uh, limit it is that uh, some of the participants, they did not have face-to-face -face, um, uh, experience in clinical and uh, pastoral education. So if we just quickly. So the research design and methodology, the aim of the study was to identify the challenges of online CP. So I recorded the distractions and positive and negative comments of the participants about online CP during 22 weeks, groups, group supervision, and 27 individual one hour supervision that were done via Zoom. I also participated uh, in eight online educational sessions for supervisors in six months, which was organized by uh, MC Asajpev is a Association for Supervised Clinical Pastoral Education, uh, New South Wales College of Clinical Pastoral Education, and ANZACP, uh, which is Australian and New Zealand Association for Clinical Pastoral Education uh, in Australia, and recorded uh, the distractions and comments of the participants as well. I also conducted a survey, which I mentioned earlier, uh, that 40 participants uh, answered the, the questions. Uh, and uh, that the result of this survey also will be briefly uh, analyzed. So about the literature review, uh, the number of academic publications about online e-learning and teaching are growing rapidly, uh, particularly after 2000, in the last uh, one decade or so. And according to the US News, many universities, including the top universities, are providing fully online courses. Due to pandemic, according to United Nations reports, over 1.2 billion children were pushed out, out of the classroom in 100 uh, 86 uh, countries. So they received online education. And the study conducted uh, by researchers at the Kent University asserted that sending text messages, responding phone, phone calls, and other distractions cause poor academic performance. So multi, uh, what we call multitask behavior and distraction can undermine the effectiveness of uh, distance courses, including clinical and pastoral education. Uh, in, in education, based on, by the way, uh, and this is from the clinical pastoral education perspective view, the research shows that the importance, nonverbal expression are more effective than verbal expression. In his book, uh, Silent Messages, Albert uh, Mahrabian finds that Communication is only 7% verbal and 93% nonverbal. It's interesting. So the nonverbal component is made up of body language, uh, 55%, and the tone of voice, 38%. So our fi fa facial expression, eyes and postures, in addition to uncovered parts of our bodies, all communicate information about ourselves, our feeling. All of that is missing in online education. So according to Flanner, face-to-face -face feedback is the soul of the clinical and pastoral education. Yes, in online, you know, still we give uh, feedback, but uh, you know, when we give the feedback, uh, not just verbally, but also our body uh, reflect that. And also the one who listens also receive, we, we can observe the body of the participants as well. But here in, in online, most of that is missing. I want to end the research by Cage, summarize their responses in the words of one of the CP supervisors. I quote, the weaknesses that I see are the people who are learning from home on the computer don't know how to relate very well to the people. 
So it's it's a, it's look like a more uh, artificial. So uh, the advantages and disadvantages of online learning, uh, because uh, you know I collected the data, the feedback uh, from the participants, from the students, uh, and based on uh, you know the, the feedback they provided to me, the advantages, it saved time. You know you don't have to travel. It saved, of course, money, uh, and uh, it's uh, it is good for your health, safety for the health, uh, particularly during the pandemic. You know, uh, then uh, it's a little chance to expose with those who have pandemic. And one of them said that no traffic, no hassle. Uh, other one said that is interesting. You know, if you're pensive, it helps you to wake up because of the distractions uh, coming from online. But disadvantage is that uh, I got it from the participants. The CPE uh, is not about the knowledge only. It's about the spirituality. So that's missing. Uh, it is not uh, available online. And uh, Enderman said that the lack of intimacy and building trust, because you know during the break time or lunch time, you know, you have a coffee or tea, you talk to each other, and also you learn a lot from each other uh, during the break or lunchtime or after the class or before the class. Um, and another one said that face-to-face uh, -face is heart-to-heart. -heart. So there's no, no heart in online uh, uh, CP. And one of them said that uh, Zoom is a room without walls. And a few of them questioned uh, about the confidentiality. You know, there are some complete theory that you know everything has been recorded. You are always in bugged and so on. And some they uh, question this as well. And one of them said that I cannot get the, the taste of uh, the taste of CP. It, it looks like artificial. And uh, another one said that you know you cannot discover yourself in online education, but you can discover yourself in on-site. And uh, also, and the one said that uh, you don't know the correct the characteristic of the participants. You uh, talk to them online, but you don't know much about their character. So that the the second part of my presentation about the dis uh, distractions, you know, my uh, data shows that approximately eighty three percent of these online sessions had distractions. So um, I uh, recorded for, uh, sorry, 47 types of distractions during that online uh, CP. I divided in uh, three groups. Number one is uh, personal distractions. For example, a muted microphone, which happened to me now. Uh, participants were changing room or places. Uh, part, 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 uh, participation, participation while driving, uh, participant talking on the phone without muting, someone was walking to the room and talking to the participants, inaccurate seating positions of participants, uh, and without awareness, uh, on and off camera, eating, chewing, leaving for feeding the barking dog, adjusting the cameras. The second uh, Types of external uh, distractions. Someone is knocking the door, uh, doorbell ringing, truck noise, someone entering uh, into the room, the voice uh, of a crying baby or toddler, children giggling, flying bird in the room, barking dog, music in the next room or the neighbor, bird singing, cat muse, car noise, passing truck noise, lawn mover noise, toddlers bullying with participants and playing with the camera, uh, ongoing construction noise, jumping cat on a participant bosom, <laughs> that happens, and uh, cars horning, uh, flying plane noise. So this that I recorded as an external uh, distractions, technical distractions, buzzing earphones, uh, echoing voice, you know, like a ghost sometimes. Oh, oh, if there's particularly when there's a 
poor reception that happens, uh, phone ringing, messages, emails, receive noise. You know, we see suddenly uh, if you receive an email, uh, all participants also, they hear that noise. Interruptions during the participants talk due to poor internet reception, ghost type of voice due to poor internet reception, inadequate lighting, power cutoff, run out computer battery, battery uh, partially disappearance of participants due to uh, virtual background, uh, distractions of the virtu virtual background such as uh, moving objects. So uh, I did a survey, uh, this is the result uh, of uh, uh, that survey that uh, 40 uh, people, uh, participants part participated. You know, the first question was, uh, did you do any of the following during the online CPE program? So like a, a multitask uh, behavior. The answer is interesting. Uh, the result shows that 45% of participants responded to their phone calls, emails, and messages during the online session. 12.5% talked to someone, someone else. 10% uh, you know, read materials unrelated to the topic. So almost 70% had multitask behavior and 30% were distracted with other things. That was based on the first uh, question. And the second question, how did you, how did the dis distractions during the online sessions impact your supervision or education? Again, uh, according to the survey uh, of the participants, 30% were not affected. 52.5% were lightly affected by the distractions, while 12.5% were moderately affected, about 5% extremely affected. And then the third question was, did you enjoy learning remotely and about e-learning or online uh, CPE? So uh, again, uh, 17.5% said that they enjoyed it in a great deal. 25% enjoyed it a lot. 47.5% enjoyed it a, a, a moderate amount and 10% enjoyed it little. So the next question was, how satisfied are you with the online program in comparison to face-to-face. -face. So the, the answer was about 12.5% uh, said that they were very satisfied. 65% were satisfied. 12.5% were neither satisfied or dissatisfied. Over 10% or 10% were dissatisfied. So the, the, the last question was, uh, you know, do you prefer the online CP course or in person? So there is a bit uh, irony here. When we look at uh, the answer, you know, 82% prefer face-to-face -face learning. You know, despite uh, the answer that, you know, they enjoyed uh, online learning or uh, satisfied, it looks like there's a contradiction here while 18% uh, prefer uh, online learning. So the results shows, show that despite uh, the overall satisfaction with the online program, most students and supervisors prefer to have face-to-face -face classes. However, uh, interestingly, no one asked questions about the ethical dimension of multitask behavior. You know, it's a... Uh, uh, we are teaching religion or learning religion. Uh, is this uh, an ethical, you know, is, is it ethical that uh, while I'm teaching or while I'm listening uh, to do something else, to have a multitask behavior? And no one questioned this. 
is also something that uh, you know I, I found uh, uh, in, in my paper. So uh, some of the feedback that I got it, uh, for example, one of the supervisor said that to me, where there is no intimacy and trust, there is no, there is no a special energy or God space. I don't feel that the energy on Zoom. Zoom to me is a room without walls. I don't think I would ever embrace Zoom for vital aspects of the CP. Another CP supervisor indicated that uh, too many distractions, some of them causing mental blow. I lost concentration on the topic that was discussed. And the supervisor said that uh, as I cannot get the taste of CP, I can't get the taste of CP, it looks like a, a artificial, you know, it does not give you the taste uh, of teaching and learning. Uh, as I said earlier, one provision supervisor indicated that face-to-face -face CP also means heart-to-heart. -heart. If there is no heart in CP, there is no spirituality. The knowledge and experience you gain through face-to-face -face at the CP courses are more effective and powerful. So face-to-face -face education gives you more chance to discover yourself and others, which uh, this is missing. Uh, another supervisor, a level three uh, educator in CP, who is 80 years old, indicated that he's very happy with the online because CP does not, uh, he does not have to drive almost an hour during the rush hours to run the course. He also said that it's, it's risk-free for COVID-19. Interestingly, two female participants were satisfied with online CP due to not having babysitter at home, you know, to take care of their children during the course. So they were able on one hand, you know, uh, do their CP course, on the other hand, also taking care of their uh, babies at home. So that also uh, and the feedback from two uh, mothers. So the, the survey results sh show that the solid and fruitful supervision is highly difficult in CP supervision, teaching and learning without face-to-face -to -face engagement, observing the body language and listening the mode of voice directly within its environment. Furthermore, it's, it's, you know, it's challenging to create a spiritual atmosphere which is necessary for pastoral care, you know, because we are not teaching mathematics or physics or uh, geometry. It, it is religion, it is spirituality. So if there's no face-to-face, -face, then there's a lack of spirituality uh, according to uh, my findings. Also, uh, in-person supervision uh, brings energy to the group. Supervisor or supervisee convey their message, message through the body language. So the person's body tells us more than his words. So it is highly difficult to pay attention to the body language and facial expression in online supervision. It's also challenging sensing the other person feeling in online session. So online uh, uh, CP program also lacks the inner development of participants. As uh, you know, Zile was talking about the inner peace, uh, in online session, it's very difficult to get also, you know, uh, to develop your inner peace as well. Uh, because physical interaction brings into play other spiritual and religious aspects of the teaching. According to data that uh, collected by Shahid White uh, in his PhD project about the online issue, uh, one of the imams said that you may listen the, to a person on the internet that is dynamic, but you don't know what his personal life is. And basically, we are ordered to find out the characteristic, the spirituality of the person before we listen to them. So. Uh, this is lacking again in uh, online uh, education. So there are uh, proponent, proponents and opponents of you know uh, online CP. Uh, that's also uh, you know uh, my findings. Uh, but uh, both camps they have their arguments and evidence as well. Yes, uh, CP online CP save time and money uh, you know, for the 
proponents because uh, uh, you know uh, it has no travel cost. Online CP gives you more opportunities to have a diverse group. By the way, you know, for example, uh, during the course uh, we, con we were connected to America to listen to someone else, or some in Brisbane, or in Sydney, or other part of the world. So it gives you more chance, probably, to be you know interactive and learn from the the experts about uh, your topics. For the opponents, it lacks the real sense of CP. It makes the program artificial. Online CP does not give the taste of on-site without placement during the pandemic. Online CP does not give you the standard hospital care skills. There is no sense of connection. It lacks the message that is given through the body language. It does not bound the participants. And uh, also, uh, and, and the point here that uh, you know the, the on, on, online CPE uh, lacks the intimacy, uh, you know, between the participants uh, and also learning uh, from each other. So they they say that uh, one of the students said that information is not digested and not spiritualized and not CPIized. What does it matter? Not probably, you know, to have the real uh, clinical pastoral education. So if I uh, conclude my presentation. You know, online CP emerged and rocketed uh, during the COVID-19 travel restrictions. Gradually, it has been integrated into uh, a CP in the last two years. This study found that there are more disadvantages than advantages, which is uh, in line of with the previous research. The advantages are that it saves time and less cost of traveling. It also gives a chance to a more diverse group, as I mentioned. But online CP makes much easier to benefit from the experience of experts in the related field globally. The major uh, disadvantages, uh, the, you know, distractions, lack of conveying the body messages through, lack of conveying a message through the body language, absence of intimacy between the participants, and the technical issues. So there are more dis distractions, uh, uh, you know, when it is done online then face to face. Uh, but I have also some uh, suggestions that could be helpful. You know, a study shows that uh, by being an active participant instead of passive participants during the online, it will be helpful also to turn off the mobile phones, tablets, and other electronic devices during the session. And second, um, you know, by identifying the distractions can help to minimize the negative impact of them, such as you know, choosing a private room or a silent location, using a pair of headphones, and following an organized daily schedule are a few of them. And the third point, probably training how to use the technology for online education. That will minimize the distractions. I think the last one, developing a sense of responsibility. You know, I am here. Uh, I'm allocating my time to learn something, not you know to have a multitask behavior. So overall, uh, yes, uh, online education it's part of our daily life. We cannot go back to the traditional way, although some may do it. Uh, but however, the, we get used to it. I think uh, we will continue to do online education uh, in CP. Maybe. Hocam, could you mute, unmute yourself, yeah, again. Yes, yeah, so. Uh, yes, please. Uh, it, it, it will uh, continue online and I think on-site as well. Uh, you know, we will never go back fully to the traditional way. However, still the traditional way is preferable. Well, thank uh, you so much. All right, thank you so much, uh, Professor Yujel. I think this is a great presentation and original research, which is based on your survey and uh, findings. Uh, I'm sure that you will publish it uh, soon and it will be available to academia and research. Uh, I think very original, uh, as you said, um, it could be applied to now education, online education system now. Now, most of the education now online 
But of course, uh, cre uh, pastoral care is uh, particularly chaplaincy program, of course, uh, is very crucial compared to other uh, subjects, other teaching subjects. And face-to-face, uh, -face, of course, uh, will be very essential uh, for uh, chaplaincy program. Uh, but uh, this uh, result, survey, survey result, I think, could be applied to other uh, education, online education, particularly in practical level, in practice, in practice-based subjects. Uh, but I think these advantages and these advantages we witness, we experience throughout uh, education nowadays uh, around the world, in Australia and around the world, and mostly. But hopefully, uh, we are turning back to a normal, traditional way of teaching, but uh, still, I think it will change uh, this educational system. This online education will uh, continue uh, for a while. All right, thank you so much again. Uh, do you have any questions, any reflections, any comments on Professor Ujjal's presentation? Please feel free to join, feel free to provide your reflections or any questions. Yes, say it. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Jazakallah khair, Ustad, for the organizing uh, this two session. And this session, the last with the Ustad, uh, was a good one. Um, but Ustad, you mentioned uh, two things in this thing, um, online uh, in online uh, education. And the one thing, multitasking. So everything was good. He addressed at the end as well, what to be done. This was the issue with it and how to minimize it was good. But even like in the online session, for example, usually like most of the university we go, so we tell some people they're using their phone, they're using their Facebook, they're using many things and laptop in during the lecture. They're sitting on the lecture, but they're still using it. They do multitasking or they're eating. So they similarly, if you do like in behind the curtain the, in, in the Zoom, but still we do the same thing on the class as well over there in the, in the lecture room. It's like eating or using mobile phone, using Facebook or multitasking somehow, which could be annoying or bothering for the lecture as well. But behind the Zoom, probably at least the lecturer could not see it, you know, if someone is eating. <laughs> well, good, good comment. Uh, when I was teaching at Monash, they developed uh, a, a methodology. So the lecturer will have the phone number of all the students. And a, a part of the lecture will send a, a question to, to all the phone numbers. So they will respond, you know. Uh, they'll check the on, what's the question instead of talking. Uh, so something... <laughs> They try to invent, but at the end, it didn't work. <laughs> yes, uh, yes, uh, a good comment uh, said, I think, uh, that still even, however, you know, uh, I think in person, because in the CP, we have five, six students, not more than eight. So that's why uh, it's not like a big lecture room, the students are just living, you know, <laughs> sitting on the behind of the, uh, the row. And, and so that, that does not exist um, in CP. Okay. Yes, Shakran. You're welcome. All right, thank you, Said. Uh, yes, uh, Zozan, Sister Zozan. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Um, thank you um, to the both speakers. I could listen to them until tomorrow, <laughs> and I never get enough of them. But I just, um, I would just wanted to make a comment in regards to Ustaz Saleh's um, presentation. Um, I. Um, in regards to the recommendations, I was actually surprised that we were not allowed to, like when we had to convert to um, online, um, we had the options of not having our videos on. I felt if we, if it was somehow made compulsory for the videos to be on, there would have been less distractions. But for me personally, every time I joined, I was the only one that had my, uh, my video on. So I felt I was the, odd one out so I um I resorted to not showing my face as well um I I I think if we were um somehow made compulsory to have the video on we would be more concerned we would be concentrating more we'll we'll be paying more attention um certainly um and the other comment I wanted to make was that I did half of my studies online and uh, on site before we had to um i mean it wasn't pastoral care um, but uh, still what i learned in the half that i did on site 
is equivalent to maybe double or triple what I learned online. Um, yeah, that's the two comments I wanted to make. Well, uh, uh, yeah, good comments, but it's difficult, you know, to restrict that, or oh, you have to uh, turn on your camera. Some people, they do, uh, but uh, personally, I don't, yeah. However, uh, in, in CP, most of them, they do generally, because, you know, we are just six, seven students online, uh, or six, seven participants. Uh, but still, you know, uh, we, we cannot impose, so you have to. All right, thank you, uh, Zozan, Sister Zozan. I think uh, it is all, this is also another uh, uh, good point, uh, good comment. Uh, yes, maybe for high school students, maybe bachelor students, yeah, it depends. Maybe particularly high school or primary, maybe more early years education. Is teachers maybe might impose, but for university and upper level, I think it, this might be too uh, too much <laughs> for, to impose. But uh, great suggestion, great comments. All right. Uh, any other comments, reflections, or any other uh, questions? Yeah, any any comments? Any do you, Zozan, do you wanna say any further thing? All right, and maybe she left. Uh, yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, if there is no any further comment and reflections or questions, thank you so much for joining today to this second uh, colloquium organized by Charleston University's Center for Islamic Studies and Civilization. As I said, uh, this session is now recorded and it will be available uh, soon, shortly. Then, of course, you can access to this session and previous sessions anytime, and you can pair it with others who are interested, and it will be available online, uh, open access, as I said. Thank you so much for joining to this second colloquium again. Thank you uh, for the great present presentations by Associate Professor Zuleha Keskin and uh, by Associate Professor uh, Saleh Hujan. Looking forward to meeting you another time. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, have, a, have a good day. Thank you.